a quick look through some of the international papers that we have. And as always, Miata and Mo, it's really good to have you both with us. I'm sure you spent, like all of us, the day watching the TV on what has just been, uh, yeah, history in the making on so many different if, different ways. But let's just focus on the Financial Times. And Miata, I, I will start with you. The paper using Joe Biden's own words, democracy have prevailed. How? What's your initial reaction to what we've been seeing throughout today uh, coming to us live from Washington? I think we were, it was really powerful words. I think there's a strong sense of relief uh, that actually what felt like an incredibly turbulent transition of power, um, the scenes on the Capitol, uh, absolutely unprecedented. All of that uh, was sort of managed through. Um, and in the end, there was a peaceful transfer of power. Um, and I think he made that point really well. And in that, I think, gave a sense of hope, um, a sense of resolve and resilience, uh, which I think will resonate with lots of people, whether they voted for him or not. Um, I thought there was something really poignant uh, seeing lots of the former presidents all there at his inauguration. And obviously, uh, Trump uh, very much not there. Um, but the fact that there were others there, the fact that the uh, former vice president um, Mike Pitt was there, uh, I think gave that sense that actually the business of democracy has continued and has withheld a really difficult period of time. And that idea of unity, we, we heard that so much throughout the day. Le Figaro also picking up on this. It's, it's headline, the La Rêve d'Unité, the, the dream of, of unity, unity, something that Joe Biden himself talking about in his speech again. It, there's a, yeah, so there's a long way to go for that to happen, not least the country so divided. We, one has to remember all of those who did actually vote, record numbers voting for outgoing President Trump. 74 million people. Um, and, you know, I don't think he, Biden won, but there was a huge number of people behind Trump, um, even after everything. And I think his tone and his message of unity was absolutely the right one. I think he played it really well. Um, it was really rooted, very solid, very authentic. Um, and again, I think it would have resonated. You know, I think he used the word lots and lots of times, and that, that is the big takeaway. Um, and the thing that really struck me was the point that said, you know, give me a chance, um, and you might not agree with me, and that's okay, but let's disagree civilly. Um, it's a different tone of politics after a really coarse, a very angry, divisive and base politics that we've had. Um, and I, for one, just feel a sense of relief. Um, it's civil, it's decent, uh, it's the way that politics ought to be, uh, where you can disagree, but, you know, the anger, the rage, the heat behind that disagreement is put to one side so that you can find common cause and consensus. And I think he's, that's his style of politics. Couldn't be any different from Trump. Um, and it's the style of politics that I think, you know, he's right. There are huge challenges facing the US, but also, you know, countries globally. And you need that sense of common purpose and unity if you want any chance of being able to navigate them. Let's look at the Straits Times, because again, the paper picks up all of the international papers, as you'd expect, uh, dominating this, but that the, the idea of unity, but everybody really raring to go. And we saw, Miata, that uh, Vice President Kamala Harris there earlier on swearing in the newest members of the Senate. History in the making there as well, when it comes to Alex Padilla, who's taken on her uh, former position, Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff. Uh, just new faces that are changing potentially the way that the uh, Senate, the balance of power there, but also just the, the dynamic of it, the diversity of it. Completely. Um, and I think it's hugely encouraging, um, the, the, the shape of the Senate, but also, you know, I think one of the challenges of, you know, a system of check, checks and balances is if you don't have a majority uh, in the House and Senate, it's very hard to get business done. And, you know, when uh, Biden sort of set out the challenges ahead of him, they are they are immense. Uh, they're humbling. Uh, they're terrifying. And not having the capacity uh, to get them through both houses or, you know, not having the levers to get through what you want to be done through both houses, I think, would have been a massive constraint. Uh, so the fact that they have control over the House and the Senate gives him 
fair weather to try to begin to address some of these challenges. Um, and I think that's incredibly encouraging from where he's standing from. Uh, there is a lot to do. Um, I think he's played it really well. So the executive orders send a message. It's not so much about what they're doing, uh, but it shows a big shift, you know, both internationally, the decision to basically uh, stop uh, the US's withdrawal from the WHO, World Health Organization, uh, to re-enter the climate accord, uh, the moves on immigration, stopping the construction of the wall, uh, stopping the travel ban on majority Muslim countries, all of that sends a signal about the type of administration that he wants to be, which I think is incredibly smart because it's some early wins that shows intent and purpose. And I hope he continues in that vein. Interestingly, the, the, not many of the papers have images of Donald Trump. The Daily Mail is going with that. Uh, Miata, Don's gone. Let's go, Joe. Uh, Donald Trump left by the back door of the White House. Well, how do we feel about him not attending the inauguration? Let's face it, he it was quite clear that he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't be there. Yeah, I mean, look, it's churlish, um, to, to put it politely. Uh, I think it's not... It's not su surprising uh, because this is a president that has broken every convention uh, and just, you know, acted in the way that he wanted without regard to the presence it sets uh, or the tone it sets. Uh, and so it doesn't surprise, but I think it's hugely disappointing. Um, and it feels incredibly childish. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think, you know, fair play to um, the, the former vice president, fair play to other presidents for standing there and saying, actually, the peaceful transfer of power is far too sacrosanct. Uh, for us to play petty personal uh, or, you know, uh, politics with this. Uh, he should have been there. Uh, I think it was wrong that he wasn't there. But that's kind of what he does. The Mirror is looking at a day of history and a day of hope. But as Mo rightly says, you know, this is the United States of America. And yet we've got in Washington more, more troops than currently in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. It's when you think about it like that, it is quite staggering, somewhat overwhelming as well. And just think back to what was happening uh, two weeks ago. It's incredible how every Wednesday, two weeks ago, uh, we were seeing the storming of, of the capital. Absolutely. And it's, you know, it's staggering times. It's incredibly humbling, uh, which is why I think there is this sense of hope. I think there's also a huge sense of relief. You know, it feels like we're moving from a period uh, where our politics has been very coarse, very angry, very toxic, uh, to, to one that feels uh, more hopeful, more unifying. Um, and I think that's a very, very good thing. Uh, you know, and I think the headline that it is, you know, a, a day of history, uh, in part because we have the first uh, woman vice president, uh, African-American, uh, Asian-American vice president, which is historic in its own right. But it's this sort of break um, from a really, really difficult, turbulent period. And I think he, he struck that note of hope. Uh, what I found really interesting is despite the fact that he set out the challenges, which are awesome and terrifying, um, there was a kind of hopeful resolve within that. Uh, and I think a lot of people share that sense that you know, we have a solid grown-up uh, back in the Oval Office uh, that uh, will get on with the business of governing and building bridges and trying to make things happen, which is a good thing for the US, but it's also a good thing for the world. Nicely leading us on to the Daily Express then, because we've got an image of the outgoing President, President Trump there, who, Miata, as we touched upon, uh, wasn't around today, left the White House by the back door. But as Mo was touching upon there, a lot of people voted for him. He increased, you know, he increased upon um, his vote from last time round. Of course, a historic turnout this this uh, in in November in the United States. But it is a divided country, and a lot of people do still believe in Donald Trump. Absolutely, you know, 74 million people voted for him. He has a huge base, a huge following. Um, you know, he left us today with the ominous words, "I'll be back." Uh, so he definitely hasn't exited, I think, the political stage. And, you know, I, I think it's really important for those that, you know, have rallied around uh, Joe Biden not to be uh, triumphalist because, you know, there is a big swathe of the population uh, that, that, you know, don't believe in him, believe in the other guy. Um, and 
I don't think you can dismiss that. Um, I think there is something deep and profound uh, that Trump was able to tap into. And I think one of the challenges for Joe Biden and the Democrats uh, in the round is how do you speak and appeal to those people and, you know, tell them that you have solutions uh, that addresses the profound anger and frustration they have with the system and the status quo that they think isn't really serving them. Um, and, you know, he is right to say that he wants to serve all Americans and he's going to have to work really hard to show people that just do not believe in the old politics that change can be made and things can get better. Um, and you don't need the kind of populist insurgency of the kind of Trump style of politics in order for them to believe that, you know, their lives could be made better. He's looking, if we look at the Metro now, make America great again, that play on words, the, the MAGA uh, phraseology that Donald Trump would, would have for his supporters would repeat, the, the mantra. But Joe Biden very much talking about uh, looking towards, you know, opening up to the rest of the world, going away from that isolationist feeling. As many of the executive orders, one is to go back to re-entry of the WHO with Dr. Fauci at the head, uh, the Paris Climate Accord. So, once again, America at the top of the table, in theory, leading the rest of the world, arguably. Yeah, and he made a really pointed, uh, you know, set of remarks around the world is watching, uh, America again being, uh, you know, a beacon for the world, uh, a force for good in the world. Uh, so I think for many countries, music uh, to our collective uh, ears. And that feels like the big change, uh, the fact that he will be far more internationalist, he will be far more uh, multilateralist as well, which we desperately need. If you take something like climate change, no country can confront it on their own. Um, and one of the biggest worries was that the US was stepping away from its obligation and the role that it needs to play there. So I think this is good news. Um, and, you know, we need America alongside others working collectively to solve problems that are global, from COVID through to climate change, uh, you know, through to whether the economy works for people or not. Uh, there are big issues. And it's great that we have a president that is willing to work with partners in order to try and confront them. With your economics hat on, this 1.9 trillion plan to tackle the crisis, it's, I mean, the figures are absolutely staggering, but it's, it's needed. Talk us through the kind of boosting of financial aid for Americans and also businesses that will go, that will support this, these eye-watering figures. I mean, I think this has been one of the, you know, most staggering things watching uh, how the economic side of the pandemic has played out. Whereas, you know, across Europe in this country, we've seen governments respond and respond, you know, pretty boldly and aggressively to what they've seen as an unprecedented uh, economic crisis and economic hit. Uh, the U.S. have been incredibly slow. Uh, so support to families, uh, about £600. And, you know, Biden now wants to significantly up that, uh, triple that, um, as alongside a big stimulus package, uh, thinking about uh, both uh, investment in uh, COVID rollout of vaccines, for example, as well as uh, supporting businesses that are hugely hard hit. Um, and I think the lesson that we are learning across the piece is to whether this storm to weather this pandemic and the economic impact of the pandemic, we need governments to step in and intervene. Um, and the US government has not been doing that at the federal level. And to some extent, they have been at the state level. There is a huge effort now uh, to basically pay catch up and make up for a year where they've not done enough, which is why we see the scale of the kind of support package he's talking about, but it's absolutely needed. This idea, this notion of Miata, of Donald Trump leaving by the back door of the White House, I mean, it, it kind of writes itself, really. It does. It does. I mean, I think it, it, uh, it, it's probably a fitting ending uh, to uh, the last four years. Um, but, but uh, you know, I, I don't think he can or should be underestimated. I, I, I doubt this is the end of his influence on the American political stage, which, you know, from where my perspective, that's a worrying thing. Um, and so I think there's a lot of work to be done on both sides, you know, by Republicans that need to maybe try to redefine themselves out with Trump um, in a way that, you know, keeps their base, uh, but potentially 
takes them a bit closer to sort of traditional values that they've had and that in some respects they've sort of put to the side um, as they've kind of embraced populism in the way that they have. Uh, but also, you know, as I've said before, for the Democrats to also be trying to reach out. Uh, I, I don't think we're quite at the kind of post-Trumpian uh, world yet, but that's what we absolutely must aspire for. And it requires all politicians across the aisle uh, to work pretty hard to win the trust and confidence um, of many people who are just disillusioned and disgusted by traditional politics.